Hey, so we're back in Ezra today and we've hit the halfway mark. So after a little bit of a halftime break last week, we're back in chapter six this morning. So why don't you turn or tap in your Bibles, open up to Ezra chapter 6. And while you're turning there, let me just give you a quick recap of where we are in the story. So God's people had been in exile in Babylon for about 70 years. And God sovereignly makes a way for them to return, go back home. And He stirs up the hearts of about 50,000 people who make the journey back to Jerusalem. And they begin rebuilding their lives by rebuilding the temple. And just as they get started rebuilding the temple, opposition comes. And the opposition comes in the form of the old enemy, the remnant of the northern tribes of Israel, who've now been kind of integrated into the Assyrians, oppose them, threatening them physically, all sorts of manipulation and political uh, interventions, and their opposition works. The work on the temple comes to a grinding halt and nothing happens for 15 years. And after 15 years, God sends two prophets to go and kickstart them back into action. That's where we left off last time, where the prophets Haggai and Zechariah speak. And we looked at Haggai, who speaks rather bluntly, saying to the exiles, Hey, for the last 15 years... You've become focused on your own lives and have neglected the work that God has called you to in the temple. And the people hear this, you know, pretty tough message, but they respond with repentance and they reaffirm their their commitment and our work starts on the temple again. It's kind of like at that moment of repentance, God, that when he had stirred up their hearts before, he's now reigniting that flame. And we see them continue to rebuild the temple with renewed courage and energy. And at that moment, remember, there's that one phrase, the eye of the Lord was upon them. And so Darius, who's king of Persia at the time, offers to protect them and even funds the rebuilding of the temple and eventually after four years of now reworking on the temple the temple is finally finished and so if you're tracking with the timeline here that's 21 years after returning back to Jerusalem finally the temple is finished so what do you do when you finally finished a project that should have taken you a couple of years, but has taken 21 years to complete, what do you do? Well, you have a massive party. <laughs> you celebrate. And that's exactly where we find ourselves in the story today. It's a great story. I think we'll need of a good story this morning. So let's read Ezra chapter 6 from verse 13 right through to verse 22. Then, according to the word sent by Darius the king, Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, Shethar Bozanai, and the associates did with all diligence what Darius the king had ordered. And the elders of the Jews built and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Ido. They finished their building by decree of the God of Israel and by decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And the house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. And the people of Israel, the priests and the Levites and the rest of the returned exiles celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. They offered at the dedication of this house of God a hundred bulls, two hundred rams, four hundred lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, twelve male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. And they set the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their divisions for the service of God at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. 
On the 14th day of the first month, the returned exiles kept the Passover. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves together. All of them were clean. So they slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the returned exiles, for their fellow priests and for themselves. It was eaten by the people of Israel who had returned from exile and also by everyone who had joined them and separated himself from the uncleanness of the peoples of the land to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. And they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. For the Lord had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them so that he aided them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. So chapter 6 is such an epic chapter in the story. It's filled with so much celebration. You would think, man, this must be the climax. This must be the end of the story. Except, of course, we know it's not the end. We haven't even met Ezra the scribe yet. But it is still this watershed epic moment in the story that is marked by these two celebrations Each of these two celebrations with kind of a sacrifice or an offering of worship going with the celebration. So the first celebration is the dedication of the temple, uh, which involved the slaughtering and presumably feasting of about 700 animals. That's a pretty decent bra, right? Uh, But if you think that's, if you think that's great, the dedication of the original temple, so back when Solomon built the first temple, involved the slaughtering and feasting on 140,000 animals, which just again goes to show that kind of what they're celebrating here, this new temple is nothing like the old temple. It's, it's not the same in terms of its size, in terms of its magnificence, and it is missing missing critically the Ark of the Covenant, which had inside of it the tablets of stone that God gave Moses and the staff of Aaron that budded before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. It's missing all of that. That's gone from history forever. And remember why that is the case, because God is busy writing a new covenant, one that does not require a fancy temple, but that will be written on hearts which leads to the particular sacrifice associated with this celebration, a sacrifice that involved the 12 goats, which was a sin offering, an offering of atonement that's given in general whenever sins need to be atoned for, and in particular on that one day, the uh, day of atonement, when it would be given for all of Israel. And again, this is something that Jesus would replace once and for all. But let's just pause for a second here and just think about the significance of this event. I mean, for the Jews living then, this sacrifice of these 12 goats represents atonement resulting in the offer of forgiveness of sins. They have not got to celebrate this for 70 years. For 70 years, there has been this accumulation of guilt without any way to experience relief from the guilt associated with sin. So that's the temple dedication and the sacrifice of the goats. Then a month after that, they celebrate the Passover. And as you might know, the Passover is perhaps the most important of all the Jewish feasts. It's the moment that they celebrate that foundational salvation story of the Old Testament when God finally released the Israelite people from Egypt on that night when the angel of death killed the firstborn sons of every Egyptian but passed over the houses of the Jewish people who were identified by placing the blood of a lamb on their doorposts. 
And again, Jesus becomes this Passover lamb that was sacrificed, which is why we celebrate communion in the way that we do. And this Passover feast is followed immediately by the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And you might remember back to that same story that when they left Egypt, they left in such a hurry, they didn't have time for the bread to rise. And so this festival that they're celebrating now one month after dedicating the temple is again critical for them because it commemorates God's act of salvation, which was their identity as a people of God. And again, just think about the significance of this celebration. Over 70 years, they have not had the opportunity to commemorate their identity as the people of God who saved them and brought them to this place in the first place. So, all of that to say, it's no wonder when you consider the significance of these events. It's no wonder that a word that comes up repeatedly in this part of the story of Ezra is the word Joy. Did you pick that up? So in verse 16, so, and the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the rest of the exiles, celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. And in verse 22, and they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. And listen to this, for the Lord had made them joyful. I mean, this is just great. So this is all that I want to do today is dig into that. I want to talk to you about the source of joy. This period in their story, after all the opposition, after all the difficulty, is now marked by joy. And we read that God made them joyful. And so how do we experience that kind of joy? How do we put ourselves in the place where God is just going to open that up and we can experience this joy? And so I want to talk to you about four sources of joy. So number one, joy comes when we complete the works that God has prepared for us. So last week, Missions Sunday, Daryl Bach kind of ended on this verse from Ephesians chapter 2. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for specific good works, which God prepared for us beforehand so that we should walk in them, so that we should accomplish them. When we walk in the specific works that God has prepared for us beforehand, when we are in sync with what He has planned and determined us for us to do, there is such a sense of blessedness that it springs up with joy. There's no doubt that the joy that these exiles were experiencing in this moment was partly due to them finally finishing the specific work that God had stirred up in their hearts to go and accomplish. And to, to be sure, it took 15 years and opposition and discouragement and getting distracted and the prophets coming to restart that work. But now that they completed, there is this massive outpouring of joy related to accomplishing the things that God has assigned for us to do. You know, I often think was one of the things that motivates me so deeply in the Christian life, and particularly when there's opposition, things aren't going so well in doing what I believe that God has called me to do. One of the strongest motivations is just believing that one day, Stand before Jesus and hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. For me, there's not much that could compete with what that must feel like to receive that commendation. And when we accomplish now on earth the things that he's prepared for us, man, it's just a small taste of what that moment will be like. So that's the first source of joy. 
accomplishing the things that God has prepared for us to do. Secondly, second source of joy is also related to obedience. But this time it's not obedience to specific calling or the call to specific works. Obedience to God's commands. In other words, walking in holiness. A joy that comes from walking obediently as people set apart to live a particular way in the land that God has brought us to. Notice this little line from verse 18. You know, as they're celebrating this dedication of the temple, it says, And they set the priests in their divisions, the Levites in their divisions, for the service of God at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. There's all of a sudden this renewed desire to do as it is written. See, this wasn't just some big celebration. What was happening here is this renewal of their identity as the saved people of God, worshippers of God, set apart to live an apart life in the place that he has called them to do. That's part of what's going on here. You can see that in, in some other verses. Verse 20, a read of how the p- priests purified themselves. Verse 21, where there's this emphasis on the exiles celebrated the Passover, but so did other people celebrate the Passover with them, so long as it was clear that they had separated themselves from the uncleanness of the peoples of the land. See, there's this just renewed sense, this commitment to doing as it is written. And no doubt, part of the joy that they were experiencing at this unique time in their story was related to this renewed sense of living in the way that God had commanded them to live. Jesus will reiterate this very clearly for all his followers later. John 15, John 16, John 17. For example, John 15, verse 10 to 11. This is not complicated. Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. There is a sense of blessedness that springs up with joy, not just when we obey the specific call of God on our lives, but obey His commands. Which leads to the third source of joy. Because what happens, what happens when we don't live in this way? And so the third source of joy is the assurance of sins forgiven. Surely, an immense source of their joy at this time was that sense of finally, after 70 years, seeing the sin offering again and knowing the accumulation of the guilt associated with sin, that 70 years of accumulated guilt, that finally they can experience forgiveness from that. And listen, this is massive. Don't underestimate the effects on our complete well-being of living with the guilt associated with sin. I'm not just talking spiritual, emotional, physical as well. So Psalm 32 describes the physical effects of living with the accumulation of guilt attached to sin. So verse 3 to 4, it says, For when I kept silent about my sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. 
I mean, just think about that as a description of, of anguish. My bones wasted away because of my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. That's an intense description of mental, emotional, spiritual, physical anguish that is associated with guilt attached to sin. But there is a release from that. It says it in verse 1, actually, of of Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. By the way, the word covered is atoned for, whose sin has been atoned for. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in in whose spirit there is no deceit. Blessed. Do you know the word blessed here and most often in the Bible means happy? Happy is the one whose transgression has been forgiven. So in other words, the Psalms is saying, when I kept silent about my sin, so when this guilt was upon me, I wasted away, but then I confessed it. Verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you. I didn't cover up my iniquity anymore. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Here's the point for us today. You do not have to wait for a specific ceremony involving a particular sacrifice. They needed to wait. There was no way they could experience this apart from the sin offering. But Jesus became that sin offering. You don't have to wait. You do not have to live with this weight, guilt attached to sin. You can acknowledge, confess, like the psalmist writes, right now. And guys, let me tell you, if you've been ever experienced like I have, living under this cloud, this weight of guilt attached to sin. There's not many forms of joy greater than the moment when that is released. And that's available because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus for all who believe and who confess their sins to him. I'm sure that's part of the source of joy here, that assurance that it's gone. Lastly, number four, source of joy comes with an intentional pursuit of reconciliation. So again, going back to Daryl Bach's sermon last week, as he spoke about those works God prepared for us, he mentioned how right away Ephesians goes into a discussion on reconciliation. Reconciliation is another source of joy, a different to the other sources or forms of joy, but equally intense. Have you ever experienced that? I know you have, hopefully, where maybe there's been this break in relationship with somebody that has maybe been like it's been an intense breakdown in a relationship that has lasted for some time and you know how that weighs upon you. And then comes that moment when finally you reconcile with them and you walk away. Isn't it the most intense, that lightness, that joy you experience? I mean, maybe sometimes, I don't know about you, but I have it in my mind where there's this conflict situation. I mean, there is this conflict, but then you have these kind of, these anger fantasies and you imagine, okay, I'm going to talk to this guy, we're going to sort it out and it just blows up in your mind. Then you have this conversation and everything's resolved and you walk away and you're so pumped, you're so happy. There's an intense joy associated with reconciliation. And I'm convinced that part of the joy they were experiencing in this moment was attached to reconciliation. And you see it in a very interesting way in our passage for today. So verse 17. So they offered at the dedication of the house of God all these animals, 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering, the 12 male goats. So what is, what's strange? There's something strange about that. What is strange here? Right, it's not the, 
number of animals, you know, being you know sacrificed. What's strange is the the number of goats sacrificed for the sin offering, 12 of them. And you think, yeah, well, I mean, we know, I mean, 12 tribes of Israel, and the text says that's why there were 12 goats sacrificed, one for each of the 12 tribes. Except, remember, at this time, there weren't 12 tribes. There were only two left. These exiles, these are the, the, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. Remember, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom had separated. There was immense hostility between them. Northern kingdom, when Assyrians decimated the southern kingdoms, the Babylonians. These are the exiles from Babylon. It's just Judah and Benjamin here. And yet, as they sacrifice this sin offering, they sacrifice 12 goats, one for each of the other tribes of Israel. It's this beautiful moment of remembering their identity, of going back to the way God had originally planned for them to be before hostility separated the ten tribes from the southern two tribes. And again, you've just got to pause and think about this moment. Because, I mean, this could have been their chance, Judah and Benjamin, if they wanted to separate, this could have been their moment. Hey, we've got the temple back. It's ours. We've done this. We're going to reconstitute ourselves. These two southern tribes will forget about northern brothers. Man, they're on their own. They got what they deserved. But instead, in this beautiful moment, they make the sacrifice and reconstitute themselves as the 12 tribes, putting their hostility behind them. And it's no coincidence that the sacrifice they offer as an act of reconciliation is a sin offering. Because it is sin that is always at the center of our hostility. Whenever there's hostility, whether it's personal hostility or whether it's something larger, like familial, maybe, or even larger racial hostility. At the center of that hostility is sin. Which is why, again, we looked at this a couple months back, but this is so important, especially in the current climate that we're living in, that Ephesians goes on to talk about that when Jesus gave up his body, he broke down the dividing wall of hostility. He was the sin offering that would break down dividing walls of hostility. And remember, that passage, Ephesians 2.14, is a reference to racial hostility, which is why it is an inevitable consequence of the gospel that we would pursue unity, racial unity. And when we do, when we stand, like those two southern tribes did in a moment of sacrificing, atoning for their sin, that they acknowledged was part of the separation and repented of that. And as they sacrificed these 12 goats, there was an immense release of joy when we pursue unity in diversity, when we pursue reconciliation going down in churches, in families, and in individuals. Man, when that happens. There is a remarkable release of joy because we are experiencing the death of Jesus and what he died for. We're experiencing consequence of that in our everyday lived reality, which is what we want, isn't it? So these are just four sources of joy. And listen, sources of joy that God gives us. Remember, the Lord made them joyful. And that's what we've been looking at today. Not natural sources of joy. You know, these natural sources that God did give us for as a, as a general act of grace, of common grace that we could enjoy, like playing with your kids, and riding bikes. And this is, these are not these natural sources of joy. These are these God-given supernatural sources 
sources of incredible joy that only come as interventions and only come when we are living in these ways. And so I think as Dave sort of started our service, we can celebrate. We can acknowledge we have so much to be thankful for and we can even experience joy in these difficult times when we live in these ways. These four sources of joy. Obedience to the call of God for specific works. Obedience to the commands of God. Living in the daily assurance of sins forgiven and intentionally pursuing reconciliation. May God shower us with his joy as we do these things. Let's pray. God, as we gather before you this morning in prayer once again, just I can we all acknowledge gathered in hundreds of homes across this city, so many um, different difficult circumstances, but with this common acknowledgement of the weight of difficulty that is upon us and even upon the world at this time. And God, we pray that as you use this time to shape and transform us, God, would you create within us this posture of living that opens up these supernatural springs of joy, even now that we take that with us so we come back stronger. And so God, would you stir up our hearts, perhaps once again, as we go back to a couple of weeks ago, that message for you stirring up hearts, stir up our hearts, that we would see the specific works you've called us to, give us the courage to do those, and perhaps if we've been on a break from pursuing that, once again, we pray, Lord, you would stir it up, fan into flame, the gifts that you've given us, especially in this time. And God, Holy Spirit, we pray that you convict us of where we're not walking in obedience to your specific commands, and perhaps that's a reason for some of the heaviness upon us. And may we as a church and as individuals renew our commitment to live in the ways that you've commanded us. And God, I pray for the sense of assurance, of relief from the guilt associated with sin that only comes through you, Jesus Christ. And we cry out to you, confessing our sins, our brokenness. And I pray now, God, for all those listening who feel the same as the psalmist, like your hand is heavy upon them. Would they know the eternal atoning sacrifice that you have committed for all of us, Lord Jesus, and bring assurance. And God, would you help us today to pursue reconciliation with individuals, perhaps in our very families, our social circles, our work situation, in our church family and as we pursue reconciliation across difficult lines of race and culture and even age and gender, God help us as a church to thoroughly pursue unity in these areas, trusting in your sacrifice Jesus that has broken down dividing walls of hostility. Unite us we pray in Jesus name. Amen.